Well, here I have this uh, rear shock mounted on the shock dynamometer. I've got the LVT that I made is mounted here. This part is fixed, it's clamped onto this tube. Uh, the free end moves up and down with the shock. Uh, now, that's normally all I use, but for the purpose of this video, I've added this string pop on to get um, displacement information directly. So I've just got a, a, a temporary uh, bracket here bolted onto the uh, bottom of the shock, the moving part of the shock, and it's uh, clamped onto this part uh, up here, this upright, in order to be still. If you're not used to the, the, the string pot, let me just move that down. Uh, it, basically it's a multi-turn potentiometer and it's got this little spring-loaded spring on it and that will move up and down and move the potentiometer inside. It's basically just a rotary version of a linear transducer like this. They're, they're both just simple potentiometers. It's just that this is a multi-turn rotary one and this is a linear one. Uh, the, the, this one could be easily uh, mounted in place of that one in the same manner that the LVT is mounted here. It could be just a little bracket off there and then a clamp uh, down here to hold the other end of it. It doesn't matter uh, which one it is, whether it's the string pot or this. I, I always use the string pot before I made the LVT simply because I had some and they're quite convenient to, to mount. So if we turn it on you can see that this is pulling the string in and out of the string pot. The velocity transducer is moving up and down as well. I've got them uh, both on and you can move down and see the, the crank motion. It's set on a radius of 25 millimeters, so it's a stroke of 50 millimeters peak to peak. So let's have a look at the software. Well, this is the uh, front screen of the shock absorber dynamometer. You can see along the, the bottom here, there are various options. Um, the calibration one, we put in some data of the load cell characteristics and the amplifier. And here, this is all we're going to look at uh, at the moment, is we can choose between having a displacement sensor to get the movement information or a velocity uh, sensor, an LVT, linear velocity transducer. Uh, for this first test, we're going to use a displacement sensor. Uh, another tool that we've got uh, access to from the main screen is this warm-up. All this is, it um, shows the temperature on each sensor because you may want to warm the shock up a little bit first before you actually start doing any tests just for um, consistency with tests you might have done in the past on a cold or warmer day uh, perhaps. So you can set a target temperature on here and uh, then click the button to start and uh, if, if this is above where is the starting temperature then it will stop when it gets to that temperature and let you know. So then you're ready to do the test at that particular temperature. This button, which is labeled friction, works at a very, very slow speed. Uh, you need some more hardware in order to take advantage of this, but it will analyze the friction and the forces due to the gas pressure and separate those out, which can be used in the, the, the tests. There's some things here whether you can add in friction or, or not, uh, but that needs a, a different setup in order to be able to use. So most of the time this won't be used. So we've now gone into the screen for actually doing a test. 
Uh, here we've got a few other tools along the, the bottom which are also available on that first screen. Uh, this one's just a, a, a quick thing where we can put some uh, data in here as to uh, the stroke that we've got set, the gearbox ratio, the uh, motor characteristics and the maximum uh, speed that we want. Well, I'm going to be doing uh, round about a maximum of 220 millimeters uh, a second. So I'm going to put 0.22 in here and then that calculates that I need to set the um, VFD uh, to around 50 15 hertz to get that speed and that the frequency of the shock will be uh, about 1.4 hertz so um, we've got the calibration again which you've just looked at a um, multi-plot feature enables us to plot up to 10 different tests that we've done and uh, saved and we've got a button here for saving it. It's blanked out at the moment because there's nothing to save. Uh, but we can load in from files that we've saved in the past if we want to have a look at those again. Anyway, I've, I've turned on the, uh, uh, the shock dyno. So now I can start the test. It's set to do five seconds. Uh, the, the, there were some things we could set up here. Uh, there was a maximum stroke uh, that's on the uh, set on the machine, which was 50 millimeters peak to peak. Uh, that's used for setting the scales on the measured displacements on the measured motion. Uh, I set a runtime of five seconds. Normally, I do it longer than that, uh, but I've just set it five seconds for this. Uh, video but there's uh, a balance that needs to be made here the uh, longer the run the more cycles you get and the better the noise filtering without removing detail becomes and uh, we can change some filter characteristics here and uh, here we can determine which graph we're going to plot now here we're plotting with the slicing time, uh, zero was at uh, the, the bottom end and 50 millimeters. It's fun to see that center at the middle, so we had a plus and minus movement. We just need to click here, the exact same curvature as we've got, uh, so here's we're at 25 there and minus 25 down here. Uh, here We've got a lot of time, but this has been derived from differentiating the displacement. But even though it's pretty smooth, when you differentiate, you increase the noise in the resulting parameter that you calculate. In this case, it's velocity, and that's even that's filtering. And I can increase that uh, filtering and get a smoother. But if we had any uh, real glitches in amongst that noise this would hide that and we'll see when we're using the velocity transducer uh, that that is a lot better so for now I'll just reduce that down so that we've only got a minimum amount of filtering on there and uh, let's look at it with the force plotted against it now this horizontal moment up here is because of that noise of velocity, so we, we need to filter that quite a bit. So
we can actually average that curve and get something in the middle and we can see what that looks like here. Now we can display that in one. So here we've got the characteristics, here we've got the known characteristics. Quite often that's plotted in this quadrant and this quadrant, and you get a bigger uh, display. So we can change which quadrants that's plotted in down here. So if I click on this, we would go up here, we want to display at the down, down here. So we prefer this, some people prefer the other one. Well, this is a uh, negative, negative quadrant, this is positive quadrant. Uh, so we can also look at the force against displacement and having these different options for looking at the force versus displacement, the force versus velocity and the force versus time, it's all the same data but we're getting different views on it and it's easier sometimes to pick certain faults or characteristics of a shock on one diagram rather than another. Uh, was we can zoom in on any part of the curve simply by uh, putting the cursor where we want to, to stop, clicking on the left button, dragging the square, then we can see the detail in more close up, in more. And we just back the other way, and that will um, zoom it. Here we've got the two temperature sensors. Uh, I haven't actually got them fitted, so they're in uh, free air at the moment. Uh, so both subjected to the same temperature. They look it's quite. Different. If you look at the scales, uh, they're up in the behind region, and uh, the graph starts at 26. So the graph was starting at zero, and these would look very much uh, close to other. And if you look. Uh, we've only got a little bit of half a degree here, about a quarter of a degree. So, probably about three quarters of a degree different from one another, and that's just simply due to the slight differences from one sensor to another. Uh, but normally we'd fit uh, the, the red one onto uh, the reservoir of the shock, if there is one, and the blue one onto the body of the shock. Now what I'm going to do is use the velocity sensor, and we can look at... Uh, the difference that that does. Let's just put the filter on the force data that we have to work with. You can see it's quite noisy because of the way in which we've had to derive it, the displacement. So now we're going to get the velocity data directly and integrate it to get the displacement data. So let's have a look at the difference. Right, I turn on the shock, you can probably hear it, start the test, it's still 50 millimeters stroke and 5 seconds duration. Okay, so now, this is a lot of as measured, no filtering, it's come straight from uh, the LED, you can see it's a very, very clean signal in comparison. If we look at the force versus the velocity, you can see there's none of noise on that at all. And if we look at the average velocity curve, we can see that. And if we look at the displacement one, here, because there's less noise on this, we can see a little bit of kink that I'm talking about, which shows us a bit of cavitation. That means that the shock needs slightly higher pressurization to avoid that. Under the uh, speed conditions that I'm testing it at. Uh, so now, if we look at the displacement versus time, this is derived from the loss. We can see it very easily curve in D to the other. As we had before, we still got the. the temperature uh, showing here. Oh, one thing I didn't look at previously uh, was the software calculates the power that's absorbed in the shock against time. And we can see that here. This is just for one cycle. Other curves that we were looking at were for two cycles. This is just for one for 
clarity. Uh, this is the energy absorbed from the back part of the shock movement, and this amount of energy is going to work on rebound. This, this blue curve is the average of the power over a complete cycle, and here we can see that it's um, approximately 50, 52. Ah, uh, that's 52 watts. So we can see that it's approximately 52 watts, which is not a great deal. So now let's have a look at its multi plot feature. Right. So here, the, the, these are just some tests that I've uh, done in the past. Um, now, some of these are the shock that I've actually got on the shock dyno at the moment, but I didn't have any tests here that had exactly the same stroke. Um, I had uh, the VFD was at a frequency of 15 hertz. This one's got a frequency of 20 hertz and this one with a frequency of 12.5. So we, between these two, we straddle what we've just been looking at. So let's, uh, if I double click on these files, that loads them here to be plotted. We can plot up to 10 different cases that we've uh, done in the, the past. Here we've just got some notes that I wrote when I did these particular tests on you can write whatever you want to there to uh, help you decide um, to, to help you remember what the test was about uh, so now we just click on plot graphs and here uh, this is the blue one stretched out more because remember this was with the VFD on a frequency of 12.5 and this one was on a frequency of 20. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that the displacement on here was plus or minus 20. The test we've just done was plus or minus 25. Now we can change what we plot and what we plot it against. Here we're plotting it against time and we're plotting the displacement. I can click on the velocity. Now we're looking at the velocity of the two of them or on the force. Here we don't want those two, uh, and we see the difference in the force against time. Or we can look at the force against displacement. Okay, we have these typical curves. Here on this one, we can see that little telltale sign of some uh, cavitation, not enough pressure in the shock. Or we can look at it against velocity, and we see the, the two different curves in here. Or we can if we look at the average force, then we get the single line graphs. And again, we can compare the two temperatures. Now here, we can see much, uh, how much closer they are uh, together, which puts in perspective because we're plotting from zero. But of course, we lose a little bit of detail there. So that's uh, pretty much all I'm going to show on this uh, video now. There are a large number of other features in the software also.